Uh, my name is Glenn Anderson, and I live in Richmond, and I am a uh, public artist. I focus on public art. I've been doing so for the last 18 years, and that spans the realm from community to uh, civic commissions. So the piece that I did for Richmond uh, about uh, three years ago was uh, called Child of the Fraser, and it's um, located at Number 5 Road and just south of Steveston Highway. It's actually in the police station, which is officially the public safety building. So I decided to, um, to take the Richmond Crest, which is two goddesses, each holding a cornucopia on the side of a shield, on top of which you have, is a shield? No, it is a shield. It's a shield with um, two fish running down the center and then a knight's helmet. For some reason, knight's helmets are on all the crests of the lower, man city, <coughs> lower mainland cities, except for Vancouver for some reason. But I don't know where that comes from. It's pretty funny. Um, but Richmond is, is less sort of rigid in that sort of medieval uh, sense. And uh, uh, because it has uh, specific references to Richmond's uh, agricultural and sort of natural landscapes and, and the industrial history here with the fish. And so I thought, well, this is perfect because the, first of all, the police station is very near the river. And to um, sort of uh, evoke Richmond's um, agricultural and uh, fishing past through the through the project, and then at the base of the uh, the uh, actual crest, it says "Child of the Fraser," which is in fact, uh, I think, the first or second line of a poem from one of the Richmond sort of grandfathers of Richmond, uh, Thomas Kidd. It's a long poem, but it was, it's very romantic and a little bit uh, sort of flowery in a kind of Edwardian way. But um, just the line alone was, I thought, quite poetic and and worked to um, describe Richmond. I mean, after all, Richmond is the child of the Fraser. And so the components of the crest then, I sort of disassembled them, sort of deconstructed their, the elements and put them back onto the building, almost as if the building is actually wearing the crest. So the crest has been placed on, the, the text has been placed on the side of the building, on the two edges, which then say Child of the Fraser. It's in a metallic finished cut sign. That's on the upper, sort of visible from the street. And then on the uh, grassy mound next to the building, there's three fish, which are three fish more or less kind of drawn from the three fish on the shield. And then the plaza itself uh, has the mosaic. And the mosaic, I've morphed it a little bit. So the goddesses are gone. And so I, I took um, the, the concept of the, their robes. So their robes are there. And out from their robes, in a sense, then is flowing the river with all the, the goodies that uh, is provided from living in a, a, a floodplain that you know, was, once was a floodplain full of rich soil that uh, allows Richmond to be such an agricultural, uh, or in the past at least, allowed Richmond to be such an agricultural mecca. I find that, um, that, that public art is um, quite often can kind of fall into a kind of uh, urban decoration. and. Uh, a lot of pieces kind of go that way, in, in my opinion. Um, and for me, it's important to kind of retain that, it's, that it is art, for example, and that it's, um, it's been made by at least the human imagination, if not the human mind. And so as we kind of walk through our urban landscapes, which are so um, sort of denatured that, uh, that there's bits and pieces that are not commercial design, um, that, uh, that are evidence of uh, of the human imagination. I mean, most of our urban landscapes are pretty, pretty utilitarian. So the fact that we have art at all in this day and age is, is super important because, I mean, in the old days, cr the craft traditions were always a part of, of the, uh, the um, design of a building, right? And so we don't have that so much now, which is a big loss for, for today's world, I think. Just our eyes are not as busy looking at stuff. They're looking at you know advertising and what kind of cars people have. They're not looking at the ornament on buildings, which ideally would speak to us in some way. Hi, my name is Nicole Dextras. I'm an environmental artist and I work in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I have a studio on Granville Island in Vancouver. And uh, I do environmental art, so I work with natural materials a lot. Uh, the work that I have in this exhibition is called Storefront Objects of Desire. And this was first shown at the Lansdowne Shopping Center in Richmond. And I was an artist in residence there. And what I did was I created pieces that were in the windows and also did performances that were in the atrium where the windows faced. 
Uh, the pieces consisted of pieces that I had made. The ones that were in the window were pieces that I had made that uh, relate to fashion because they are objects like shoes and dresses, handbags, headdresses, different kinds of things. Um, but they're made out of natural materials, so you can't really wear them and you can't really buy them. They are somewhat wearable in the sense that you could wear it maybe for a day or a special occasion. But, you know, some of the things are completely not wearable, like some of the shoes that have thorns on them. <laughs> you basically can't wear those. The materials that I use are often things that I've gathered in the local landscape. And sometimes they're the inspiration for what I'm going to make. Uh, sometimes I'll see a leaf or a flower and I'll go, oh, wow, that looks just like the ruffle of a skirt or something. And that spawns this whole, uh, sort of, you know, linkage of ideas that then leads me to creating one of my pieces. My work is interested in supporting things like slow fashion and eco fashion, which are new trends today. And I know that designers, young designers that are working in that realm today have a hard time breaking through because we live in such a commercial world that they have to compete with things that are made overseas that are very cheap. So to make things by hand is now a real struggle in our world. So those are some of the things that my work also talks about. So um, that's one of the reasons why I keep it in the context of fashion, because I'm trying to uh, reach out to that idea. I've done other works in the public realm before. Some of them have been sanctioned and supported by the art world. Some of them have been totally guerrilla. <laughs> As in, one of the first projects I did was under Broad Bridge, and I started weaving things uh, and making little sort of dome shelters with uh, blackberry vines that are covered in thorns. Um, that was totally unsanctioned. But it was at the very beginning, and it gave me the taste for how much I love uh, doing work that's in the public and engaging the public directly because I find they are so interested. If they get to talk to the artist and meet the artist, then, you know, it's not the white cube anymore. It really is engaging. So that's one of the things that I've continued to pursue in my work. So I look all, for all sorts of um, venues and opportunities that will let me do that. So like being in the shopping mall allowed me to do that. Um, also, I've done things in public gardens. I've taken things out onto the street. Um, so it goes on and on. The ultimate thing that I want to do with storefront objects of desire is to have it in a real retail space. Um, I want to completely make up a space that looks like a store. So it doesn't look like a gallery anymore, which is usually, you know, installations, you know, they're an installation or they're things on the wall. But I want uh, shelving and racks and lighting and counters. I want to be the sales clerk. Um, I will also do makeovers in the store. And I want to play with people who come into this space and sort of kind of tease them about this boundary between what is for sale and what is not for sale. I'm Jacqueline Metz and I'm Nancy Chu. We're based in Vancouver and we met in 1986 at UBC. And we have uh, quite a varied background. Um, mine's in uh, painting, drawing, um, printmaking and curating. And my interests when we met were in photography, archaeology and literature. And I think all of these interests have continued to inform our work yeah, to, until yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. And but we were um, connected through a common interest in landscape and art and cultural thought and public space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one piece we have in the show is called Stillness in Motion. It is a ninety-foot-long glass bridge at River Green, which is right next to the Richmond Oval. Um, the glass on one side, the, spanning the whole ninety feet, is actually a photo-based art piece. It's um, uh, it's like a slice through a hair and rookery. It's quite domestic and quite intimate. So when you're walking inside, and it's, and it's life size, when you're walking inside, you're walking past these herons, and you know, herons stand about chest high. And so you're walking through this, this canopy of trees. And from the outside, 
it's like a it's a slice through a canopy yeah. of trees, so it's quite abstract. It's abstracted yeah. by that, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and up close, it's abstracted because um, it's very pixelated, and the image is kind of blown apart when you're standing within the bridge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is and having the shadows cast over you. That's quite yeah. quite a cool space to be in. Mm -hmm. And then at night, it has a different presence. Um, there's a, a a light emitting diode piece that's ten feet high and ten feet wide on one of the glass walls, and it's the image of a heron flying. So it's this looping video, and it's very meditative, and I think quite absorbing. People bring their guests to visit it at night. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite compelling. Mm -hmm. And when you're within the bridge, because um, that screen is translucent, you can stand in that bridge, look through this moving heron, and see the view beyond, mm -hmm. which is quite cool, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. And actually, that video is tied to an astronomical clock. Yes. So if people want to go see it, um, it comes on half an hour before sunset, and then it's turned off at 10 o'clock at night. So it would be nice. You know, and it is a public space, so people can um, ride their bikes mm -hmm. or drive to the courtyard and uh, watch the video. Yeah, so the, the other piece we have in the show is called Made in China. And it's at the Prado Residences, which is on Lansdowne, just east of Number 3 Road. Um, so the site that was given to us was a landscape area that is along the walkway into the entrance of the um, uh, of the towers. So it's a very public space. And on it are these five low concrete walls. So we were um, in this curio shop in Richmond, and we picked up one of those little metal dragons that, big. <laughs> that you see in the show. Yeah. And when, when I look at something like that, it takes me back to ancient China and how these were when, you know, usually magnificent bronzes are, are sculpted out of stone. And really, they, were, they only uh, were the entranceway into um, the emperor's palace or the temple. So we started, we started thinking about that, thinking about how something that's so monumental and only for one kind of part of society becomes this thing, this tiny little thing that's, that anyone can go to a store and buy and how a modernization and the whole industrial process changes um, our access to culture, how we use culture. And, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, you could have one of these little dragons or a few in your home. So what we did was we took this, uh, this little dragon and blew it back to that architectural scale. And uh, so we set them on the, the low concrete walls and they're at eye height. So when you're walking by, you're looking at the eye of the dragon. Yeah, so it's about how a piece can be um, transposed from one culture to another and how meaning can change through time and become something new. My name is Carlin Yandel. I'm based in Vancouver, BC. I um, have always been a maker. Uh, ever since I could make God's eyes out of popsicle sticks and I advanced from there. So I've always been making, but my career has been print journalism. So I spent the majority of my um, adult life in uh, newsrooms, running newsrooms or being a beat reporter and then later on being a columnist. So I have two pieces in the show. Uh, the first piece is called Crossover and the second piece is called Cluster. So the first piece is um, a, a design for the scramble type crosswalk in the historic fishing village of Steveston. And um, that was a very immediate um, idea. It came to mind because I was um, the editor of the longstanding community newspaper out here for some years and I knew a lot about the history of the area and also about the issues that were sort of hitting Steveston at that point. And one of the main issues was saving the Phoenix Net Loft. So that was sort of in the back of my mind as I was um, looking at the call for a design for this um, scramble type crosswalk. So I immediately thought about this should be a net and the idea of a net um, connecting the past to the present and also the net as an idea of, of a safety zone for pedestrians, sort of a way to catch people. Um, and so then, as soon as I came up with that idea, I went to my macrame books and I started to revisit the nodding that I learned back 
at age 13 and uh, the edge knots and the Josephine knots and the square knots and just started to play with it and that's really how I come up with a lot of my ideas I just sort of mine my muscle memory and then from that point I um, ideas come as I make and then as as the then the ideas sort of lead to more making so it's kind of a symbiotic relationship so the second piece is called cluster and it's a completely different experience than the first one because this one I'm seeing it from the design phase the concept phase all the way to the end when when it's installed and it's going to be installed on the top of the last guideway of the Canada line in the city center of Richmond I wanted something that felt light and exciting but also had a little bit of a uh, a punch to it, a little bit of a visual punch. I eventually came up with the idea of a cluster of uh, pipes and uh, that would sort of visually look like they were extruding from the end guide rail. And that would, um, for me, that was kind of like a very large representation of maybe a fiber optic cable or exhaust pipes or that sort of thing that just kind of come out. While the crossover was quite simple, this one was full of complexities because there are a lot of stakeholders involved in that project. So um, it wasn't just a matter of getting a bunch of brightly colored pipes sort of bound together and, and throwing them up there. This is a height above pe where people walk. It's a high pedestrian zone. It's an area with a lot of vibration. I love the challenge of trying to find something in that space, but it was... Um, a little unnerving trying to get my head around all the, the, the structural engineering. There's a lot of complexity, but I think that the, the original idea still remains. And that is, if you're a passing commuter coming down the main drag in a car or in a bus waiting to connect to the Canada line, as you approach, you see the circle within circle kind of pattern that you might see with a severed fiber optic cable. But as you pass by the whole sculpture turns very into horizontal lines, which I kind of relate to uh, hard edge abstract painting with these high vibrant colors that are all selected based on the um, color coded wires of fiber optic cables.